Hello, I'm Mark Philpot, the founder of Humanity. I'd just like to quickly say thank you for watching the video today. And if you like our content, make sure to subscribe and follow our channel. We have three podcast shows, the Global Travel Channel, the Global Business Podcast, and Conversations with Humanity. So there's plenty for you there to have a look at and to follow our journey. So please subscribe, follow our channel, and leave as many comments as you like about what you think of our shows. Enjoy today's show. So it's a very good morning to my guest on the Global Travel Channel podcast show today, Mr. Barnaby Davies. How are you, Barnaby? Very well, thanks, Mark. Yeah, we're in the middle of a heat wave here in the UK. And when I say heat wave, I mean 23 degrees. <laughs> Well, you know what? We're in the middle of winter today down here, down under, and it was 23 degrees today here. So there we go. We've <laughs> that that puts winter. it into perspective, I guess, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I was That's actually right. going to say to you, those two words, heat wave in the UK, don't really go together too well, do they? No, I think it's an oxymoron. <laughs> yeah. So now that you've told everybody where, where you're talking to us from, can you be a bit more specific? Whereabouts in the UK are you exactly? Oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah, a place called Hastings in the UK, and it's known locally as a drinking town with a fishing problem. That's, <laughs> that's how we like to describe it here. And it's it's an amazing place, actually. It's, it's where the first Norman castle was built. Hmm. So if you know if you know your history, obviously that was 1066. So that's still here. It's crumbling a little bit, but it's still there. We've got some fabulous smuggling caves, actually. A lot of stuff was smuggled here in the 16, 17, and 1800s. Oh. So there's all sorts of legacies of that. All the pubs were involved. All the churches were involved. And uh, we've got the biggest beach-based fishing fleet in Britain here. Wow. Maybe even in, in Europe, actually. Extraordinary. Well. Extraordinary. Yeah, now you, it's amazing for the you, tourists to watch that. Yeah. You're, you're already a step ahead of me because my next oh. question was going to be asking you, why should people come and visit Hastings? Because uh, of all these wonderful things that are going on. But is there anything you haven't mentioned yet that is a highlight of visiting that area? And tell everybody oh, exactly where Hastings yeah. is because a lot of people watching and listening to us today have no idea where Hastings is in the UK. Yeah, do you know, I find that when I travel around the world, I say Hastings and people say, oh, I'm not sure. If I say Brighton, which is just down the road, that's 30 miles or 50 of your kilometers, they know exactly where it is. Mm. Brighton is Brighton's more famous for nightlife and stuff going on. But Hastings actually has the incredible history I think. And as I don't work for the tourism board, Mark, you're going to make it sound like I'm, I'm, I'm peddling it here. But uh, we also have a Guinness World Record in Hastings for oh. most number of pirates on a beach. So you, they open up a big enclosure on the beach and then we have to wander down there with a parrot on your shoulder, etc., etc. Et yeah, we've got 15,000 pirates. Oh, and the other thing is it's, it's home to the World Mini Golf Championships. Oh. It's, tele yeah, it's televised, Mark, the World Crazy Golf Championships. How about that, then? And and what time of the year is that actually played? It's not played in December, is it, when everything's uh, iced no, over? No, no, and... that's, no, that's uh, in June. But it's open in the winter as well, and that's right. a good time to come. And the, the, the one other thing that I really think is amazing in Hastings is the level of musicianship. We have every night, assuming it wasn't lockdown and corona, but every night there was jazz, blues, folk, rock, whatever you like, in a number of pubs. And the, the standard is just world class. We're, yeah. we're renowned for it. Yeah. So there's no so shortage come, of yeah. excitement in Hastings by the sound of it. No, it's a, it's a great place. Yeah, if anyone comes, yeah, get in touch and I'll, you know, I'll help you out with it. The uh, football team's not as good as the Brighton team, though, is it, by any chance? Oh, I try not to get involved with football too much. Yeah, I'm probably one of the very few UK men that's not particularly interested in in football. I've never, it's never appealed to me, honestly. Well, there you go. I'm one of those people as well, so you can be pretty much rest assured we're not going to be talking about football on the show today. 
Ah, right. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, what I do with all of my guests is I give you the opportunity to actually dedicate your show to someone special in your life. So who would you like to dedicate your show to today? Oh, it would have to be my boy who's nine, my son Theo. Okay. So Actually, yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's interested in, in travel, Mark. Fantastic. Well, it's funny you mentioned Leo because I was having a chat to him a couple of days ago because he's had dad around for a bit of a while now and you seem to be annoying him a little bit. So he told me about some of the things that you have been doing. And if need be, I will bring those up during the show. So you might have to be right. on your best behavior today. Okay. It's, it's Theo, by the way, Mark, not Leo. Oh, Theo. Did I say Leo? Yeah, just a little glitch. Oh, I might, have, I might have been talking to the wrong chap then. <laughs> well, if I, if I call you Phil, you'll probably say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah. Fair enough, and a good comeback there as well. Thank you for that. Okay, well, Theo, this is for you, the show. Daddy's giving this dedication. That's a lovely dedication, I have to say. Now, you're not originally from Hastings, I gather. You were born somewhere else. Yeah, I was born up in the Shetland Islands, which is further north than you might think. If for, and the reason I say that, actually, Mark, is when you're watching the television and they do the weather forecast, they put the, the Shetlands just in a box off the northeast of Scotland, because if they put it where it actually was, it would be off the screen. <laughs> so it, it's up at 60 degrees north. So that's level with Anchorage in Alaska. Oh, right. OK. So it's way up there. Yeah, mm. it's, it's way up there. Yeah. And it, there are different ways of getting there. You can either go by boat, and it's 12 hours overnight from Aberdeen. It is. I've been on the ferry. There we are. And what do you reckon, the, the ferry or the plane? They're, they're both a, dodgy. It's a horrendous ferry journey, and I wouldn't recommend it yeah. to nobody. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's one of those things. Like, if you go, you've probably been to Antarctica. The, the Drake Passage, you could get it smooth as a mill pond, and it's delicious, or it could be very, very rough. And that's the same with with Shetland. But your other option is to fly. And who wants to be on one of those little Fokker 50s <laughs> in, a, in a Gale Force 8? You know, so whichever way you go, you just want nice weather. And then it is a it's a it's a beautiful place. And I would definitely encourage people to go there as well. You, the wildlife's amazing. You've got seals. Uh, you'll see seals on the rocks all the time. You've got little puffins. I've got a puffin on the back there. Right, you have. Uh, yeah, I can see that. Launching them launching themselves off the cliffs and you got whales there's yep. lots of whale spotting going on there and again the music you know the little shetland music uh, sessions in the bars is uh, that's a treat to behold as i'm as i'm sure you found out when when you uh, showed me that puffin i was thinking it might have been the mayor of lurwick there um is is that who it uh, is is it, is it a mascot for that's him it. <laughs> that's it yeah he's uh, well it, it is scottish as, as you know uh, but most people probably don't know that really the heritage is Norse. Mm. That's why we that's why we don't wear the skirts there. I mean the kilts. I have to be careful saying that, yeah. But well, the, they don't wear they yeah. don't wear kilts. Yeah. Because it is is Norse heritage, but it was annexed by the, the Scots in the late fourteen hundreds, I think. Yeah. And if and if I mention the word Zetlin to you, you'll be familiar with that as well. And uh, there's lots yep. to do there's lots of things that people don't know about Scotland, I've found out since I've been doing this travel podcast. And one of the things is that there's over 700 islands around Scotland. And you would know that. And because there's, I think there's around about now, I'm going to test my own memory here, about 100 around Shetland. Is that right? About 100 islands make up Shetland Islands? Yeah. Not that many are inhabited. There's probably only a dozen that are inhabited. Mm. But again, it's, it's bigger than you think, or that, that listeners might think, because it's 90 miles from top to bottom of Shetland. Right, right, okay. Is, uh, but there are there are parts of it where you can throw a stone between one side and the other, and other bits, uh, <laughs> other bits are much much fatter. And the th I, th I suppose the thing that people notice up there is the lack of trees. Mm. Mm. When you go because of the salt wind, trees just don't grow up there. So oh. that's kind of the interesting thing. I was going to say there's a lack of a, quite a few things up that way, but I wouldn't be oh. so rude because it's your uh, your homeland. What was it like growing up there as a young boy? Well, in fairness, I only stayed there until I was two. 
I kind of had enough. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It was my decision. Well, in fairness, actually, I did have hypothermia while oh. I was up there, oh. which was a little bit unfortunate. Uh, our our roof was not ideal. It wasn't in the best of conditions, and <laughs> yeah, I kicked off all the blankets as a little baby, and did turn a, a purplish sort of colour. So that was kind of my first bad travel experience, I guess. Yeah, so, so, being up there. so after two winters, you chose to get out of the place. That's it. Yeah, I said that. That's it. <laughs> Where did you go to after you left the beautiful Shetland Islands? I came south to a place called East Anglia to Norfolk, which is also a beautiful county. Mm. But I wasn't there for that long. Really, I've grown up in the south in and around Hastings mm. and uh, yeah, one of the things I've, I've really found, actually, is that when we're, when we're living somewhere, we always want to go somewhere else, don't we, as travellers? And I, I meet so many people who live in London, for example, who say, oh, I've never been to that museum, or I've never been to that little walk on the, the Thames River. And this corona is actually giving me a, a, a chance, or all of us a chance, to actually explore our own backyard. Yeah, I love that you say that because I totally agree with you. And the whole fact that, you know, domestic tourism is booming in a lot of countries at the moment and people are seeing parts of their country for the first time. Um, you know, travel doesn't need to be getting about the passport out all the time and heading off somewhere overseas, does it? It can be it can be just a count, couple of counties across, really. And uh, you can see things that you never experienced in your life before. Yeah, I'll give you one very quick example mark of that 20 miles from here we've got something called the sound mirrors that mm. were built in the, in the 20s they're these huge great concrete structures uh, that used to listen out for german aircraft coming across the channel right great big like 200 feet in diameter listening devices wow. that became they, they became obsolete because of radar and the the planes were coming quicker so then, then they couldn't pick them up in time yeah but absolutely amazing and they're still there these decaying concrete structures and i went to visit them just the other day and they're they're so close hmm. but i'd never been there so and are they, real chance to connect are yeah. they are they something that are attracting a lot of tourists like is did you see there there was a lot of other people there while you were there no actually uh they are not a tourist attraction you're supposed to go with a birding volunteer because there's it's on a little island and there's bird nests there mm. this is incredible if anybody wants to google this just put in sound mirrors in kent yeah and you'll be there all, you'll be there all day looking at this so i went down there knowing that you couldn't go across right but i met these met these youngsters who were looking a bit damp as though they might have been swimming and they said oh you can just wade across there so i thought that sounds like an adventure went across had a little look on this island and came back and literally I just waded back across and this guy in military fatigues with binocular came over and said, have you been on the island? And I was dripping wet. I couldn't really say no. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, yeah, you're not supposed to go over there. But I said, well, I was, I was very careful. And he was a mine of information. Yeah. So, yeah. Just go and talk to people. You know, that's, it's just such a it's a world full of opportunity, isn't it? Talking to people, finding stuff out, I love it. And it's a unique thing when you travel as well, because often you meet people where you're both out of your comfort zone, and there's that whole aspect of travel that connects you, right? And you're both exploring, and I guess you're a bit more vulnerable too, right? When you're traveling, so you have you have deeper conversations. I find. When was your first? And let's let's go past the two year old experience when you got out of the Shetlands, right. but. When was yeah. your first meaningful overseas travel experience that you can remember deeply? Oh, there's a, oh goodness, there's a few of those. But it, it, what is imprinted, I suppose, on my memory is going to France just on a day trip with my dad when I was seven or eight. Mm. He, he took us over there. This was this big trip. There's another country. There's French people. Let's go. And I... <laughs> What I remember most from that is him trying to speak French. Right. <laughs> real, real pigeon French, but doing it with an English accent, which he thinks is charming. Right. <laughs> uh, well, you know, when French people speak English, you think, oh, it just sounds so romantic and fabulous, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 And I, 
I don't think speaking French in an English accent has quite the same appeal. But, but there we are. Anyway, he made this absolutely, absolute dog's breakfast of trying to order an ice cream. And right. it was great. Cause this, this guy just replied in English, and it turned out he was from Brighton. Right. But it, <laughs> yeah. But it was wonderful watching my dad flounder uh, and try to try to speak French. And it, it was, that, I guess that was my, my first, first foreign travel experience. Yeah. So as a seven year old, you must have really loved it in terms of not only the ice cream and, and, you know, taking the mickey out of your father, but I guess in terms of going to a, a foreign land and seeing it for the first time, did it give you kind of a sense of, I want to do more of this. So I want to get out and explore the world. Oh, it absolutely did. Yeah. Half of it for me is the journey. Mm. So I, I always have this sense of adventure when I go down to Dover, down to the, the boat there, get on a boat and off I go somewhere. Mm. And I was very fortunate, I suppose, a little bit after that in that I, I started playing a trombone oh. at school mm. when I was 12. Yep. And very quickly I joined a band and then we started doing foreign trips so one of my first foreign trips, I would have been 13, and off we went on tour to Belgium. Right. That was great, because I was a little bit older, and I could kind of understand what was going on a, a little bit more. And that, again, made me think, oh, there's this whole world out there. I've got to do do more and more of this. And, and gradually, of course, that, that ramped up and got uh, busier and busier with travel, yeah. Where did you go in Belgium? A little place called Oudenard. And Ooh, no, no. I'm probably still famous. One of the things I remember there, actually, is that you seem to be able to buy alcohol at any age, <laughs> which was a, a, a revelation from from here. Yeah. So I did have. Uh, I, in fact, I got suspended from three orchestras for for having a few drinks in uh, Oudenard at 13. So not one of my finest moments, Mark. I'll tell you what, Barnaby, I'll let you know a little secret. I lived in Brussels for 13 years and. I never saw your name etched in any of the bars across Belgium, in particular in Oldenard, where I used to go, by the way. So um, you're, you're all clear, mate. You've got a clean bill of health in Belgium. Fabulous, fabulous. <laughs> right, I'll, I'll head back, yeah. So tell us more about the uh, the Travelling Wilburys. When the, was that the name of the band? Uh, no, that was actually the East Sussex Youth Orchestra oh. that I went over with then. Yeah, I, I travelled with a few bands, actually, youth orchestras, mainly and i was very fortunate to get invited on all of these trips you know we, we played in berlin in 1990 right went over there so i was i uh, won't say how old i was but fairly young yeah and and that of course that was amazing because you're there right after the berlin wall came down yeah yeah and exactly at, at that point you know people were still breaking bits off the wall yeah uh, so it was <sighs> that's obviously not the right thing to do <laughs> but at the, at the time people just were and that so you know I actually had a slice of history and I was experiencing what had actually happened and, and I suppose that's when my curiosity and, and knowledge about the world started expanding a little bit more when you start having an understanding of, of historical facts that mm. have influenced current events yeah so tell us how did the trombone come into your life what was the inspiration there well that was serendipity you know how sometimes things just come into your life? Yeah. Never a trombone, I can tell you, though. <laughs> no. Well, you've been, you've obviously been lucky. Yeah. I, I was on a, I'll tell you in a sec, I was on a, on a tour once and somebody said, what's the definition of optimism? And they said, a trombone player with a business card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But what happened actually, Mark, is I was at school and I already played a little bit of piano. Yeah. Yep. Uh, we had a piano in the house and my mum's a, a keen piano player. Yep. And there I was at school and the music teacher said, there's a trombone available with lessons. If anybody wants to have a go, then let me know. Right. And for some reason I just found myself, as I usually do, <laughs> just saying yes to, to some sort of new experience. And actually I took to it like a duck to water. Right. Uh, I love it. I loved the the trombone, and then I progressed, and I went through through the Royal College of Music, etc., uh, etc. Et You're lucky it wasn't Chainsaw Day at school. Absolutely, yeah, it could have been anything, <laughs> couldn't it? Yeah. So, how long did you? Are you still playing the trombone? That should be the question. 
I am still playing. I took a break, Mark. I had some I had some problems at university or, or music college. I just couldn't quite get it right. Yeah. So I, I was never quite destined to be at the absolute top and on tour with the Tower of Power or the Grease musical or anything like that. Uh, so I put it away in the attic for about seven years when I was 20. Right, okay. I thought, right, I've had enough of that. I'll go off and do something else. And then I came back to it and I still play today. And it's one of, somebody asked me recently, when are you happiest? Hmm. Which that's a, that's a difficult question, isn't it? When yeah. are you happiest? Yeah. Who, who am I going to offend here <laughs> by, yeah. by yeah. saying what I, what I like doing? And actually, one of the things I really love doing is sitting in a big band. So 17 people in the pub, 17 musicians plus a singer. Yeah. And sitting there playing lead trombone and there's no time to be thinking about anything else. Mm. It's eyes down, you sight reading everything. So nobody's ever seen the music, but they're all professional musicians and just go, there's people dancing, people smiling, beer falling out of glasses all over the place. Oh, it's great. I yeah. better put you in touch with my uh, guest from yesterday because he's traveling around the world at the moment with a camera and he's interviewing everybody for a documentary he's making. And the question he asks everybody is, are you happy? And you've just described ah. what makes you happy. So there you go. That's a fantastic fit into um, the documentary. Yeah, so I'll give him your address that. in Hastings and you'll get a knock on the door in due course. Oh, fabulous. Yeah, that'd be <laughs> fun, Mark. Yeah, great. <laughs> so so where, did, where did that whole music uh, experience take you to? What was next on your trajectory in life when it came to music? Because I hear that you've been rubbing shoulders with some pretty high and famous uh, musicians around the world as well. That is that is true. Again, you know, that's serendipity. Once again, it, it's kind of just saying yes to an opportunity again. What happened is, you know, Smokey and the Bandit, the movie. Mm, mm. Well, in the back of my mind, I watched that when I was about 15 and I always thought that looks interesting. Bootlegging liquor across the Texas state line. <laughs> so when I... When I came out of music college and wanting to do something else, I knew it would have had to be going somewhere doing something. And so I got one of those big heavy goods trucking licenses. And then I started just driving baked beans from London to Manchester. Right. And I'll tell you, that's not an adventure. That is sitting on a <laughs> on a motorway, just delivering to a supermarket and coming back. It's no fun at all. So what happened is I, I ended up just talking to this guy at a delivery center and he, I was mentioning trombone stuff and my interest in music. Yeah. And he said, ring this company down in London. They do rock and roll trucking. Oh, they, they, yeah, they deliver all the, the lights and the sound and what we call backline, yeah. which is all the music, musical instruments on tour. I mm. thought that sounds good. So mm. this was in, this was in 1998, Mark, the days where you'd, and nobody had cell phones. You'd, you'd have to put things in a in a uh, <laughs> coins in a box. <laughs> so I rang this. Oh, so this is this is the key to the story, really. This guy said, "Tell him you know Dave Smith. Okay, he's uh, he's he's key in the industry. He's just well known. Yeah, right? so notorious name, him. really, Dave Smith. Dave yeah, Smith. yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> so anyway, I, I rang this guy in London, the head of the company, and said, "Oh, Dave Smith told me to give you a call." Are you are you busy? And it was great that the lights went on and he said, oh, yeah, busy, busy. Yeah. What are you doing on Saturday? I said, I'm free. I'm free. What's happening? And he said, well, I want you to fly to Italy, south of Italy and be the second driver on a truck driving north up to up to Genoa. So this is what happened. I went down there, got in the truck and he, he called me while I was driving up through Italy and he said, you don't know Dave Smith, do you? <laughs> well, busted. Talk about busted. I mean, caught red-handed there, Mark. I said no, and it was great because he said, "Well, how are you getting on?" And I said, "I'm loving it. This is good." He said, "Well, all right then. Do you want to do the Beastie Boys tour when you get back?" Right. And that was it. So straight to my the top. Advice, my my <laughs> hot tip, I think, is. You have to be slightly cheeky to get ahead in life, I think. Yeah. And and my my philosophy, Mark, really is, do whatever you like, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. 
That's kind of what, how I live. So if you can get away with a, a little cheeky thing, I then proved myself in, in the company and went on to drive for, yeah, some, some big stars, I suppose, ACDC from Australia. Right, right. And uh, where did you go? Where did you go? So tell us about some of the places you ended up going around the world with uh, some of these gigs. Right. Well, because I was driving the big 18 wheel trucks, I didn't do the entire world tours. What I would do is within Europe. OK. But that was still a long way. I mean, often we'd head down to Istanbul or out to Moscow. That's kind of five or six days drive uh, from from here. Mm. But all all over and what really i noticed was nuts is that a lot of these tours are organized by american production companies and i think they just get a dartboard of europe you know like you guys probably think europe's not very big <laughs> australia's better than everything but, and they, they they throw a dart somewhere and it would where's that istanbul let's do a gig there it, i mean i came out of i'm just thinking i came out of athens once on an acdc tour and yeah. the next show was in Lisbon. I mean, that's 38 hours driving a truck. <laughs> plus, a, plus a ferry ride across from Petras to Ancona in Italy, Greece to, Greece to Italy. I mean, that's a long way. That's a lot of diesel, and they do 10 to the gallon, these trucks, or 9 to the gallon, really. Maybe that's where they were selling the most tickets, though. Absolutely. And in fairness, what a lot of people don't realize when they see the, the tour dates doing all this sort of thing all around Europe, is that they do often run around festivals or which which venues are actually available. Yeah, right. So if they, they have to book that, then I wish they'd just start from the beginning and, and book everybody's tours in, in a sensible way, but it, it never works like that, unfortunately. You're always doing far too much driving. Uh, I mean, I'll give you another mad example of that, actually. We had a Madonna tour, probably, I don't know, 2008 or 10, mm. And we had we had two shows in London. The next show was in Rome, so we yep. had to get th three drivers to get it non-stop down to Rome. Right. And then we had then we had two more shows back in London. <laughs> so, are you guys being serious? I mean, what a use of diesel! So you know, a lot of people yeah. complain about the airline industry being a pollutant or the major pollutant of the world. When you've got the uh, music industry doing logistics like this, it's turning out to be a bit of a disaster, isn't it? It is, yeah. It, well, of course, the the logistics industry, or certainly in the music industry, is off at the moment. I mean, I I, I think we're all hoping that 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 comes back and we can have hundred thousand <clears throat> seat stadiums for rock and roll concerts. And my thing, Mark, really is that. I want the technology to change. You know, I just I'm always interested in green energy and renewable green energy mm. and some of the amazing tech stocks we've got in the Nasdaq at yep. the moment. Yep. Uh, you know, just developing hydrogen tr trucks, which is, a, of course, a renewable energy. And what I'm waiting for is the airlines to be able to run on some sort of sustainable fuel. It, and it, it's got to be coming, hasn't it? Yeah. It's got to be. I, I'm thinking, though, that most of the airlines are going to be out of business when Elon Musk has a spaceship going from London to Sydney. Absolutely. How long is that going to take? Like well, they're talking. Minutes. he's talking about less than an hour. So, <coughs> well, excuse me. Unbelievable. Oh, I've, yeah. got a, I've got a top tip here, actually, if, you, if you're sneezing and people get nervous <laughs> now, don't they? So <laughs> what, what you have to say is uh, it's all right. It's only tuberculosis. It's only tuberculosis. Uh, which, <laughs> okay. Yeah, which is... Way more contagious, but people don't worry about that now. They they only worry about the corona thing. Well, excuse yeah. me, excuse me for that, but I do know I've done my research before I started the show that I cannot spread COVID nineteen through my microphone as yet. Oh, phew! Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you've done a lot of travel, and you've done a lot of travel in different dimensions, wearing different hats. So. Tell us, mm. tell us about, you know, what's it like to travel as a roadie versus traveling in a, as a trombonist in, in a band shooting around Europe and then doing some of the other trips that you, you've done? How does, how does the different forms of travel get you to see the world in a different way? Or does it? That's a good question. Yeah, the, the music industry is, is mainly hard work, I would say. And there's an awful lot of people in there that are actually not interested in traveling in which case i don't really know why they why they do it mm. because, because mm. 
you are you're on the road all the time and i mean just <laughs> off the top of my head there are plenty of tours where you don't actually get to see very much because there's shows every day and they're a long way apart so you, you're sleeping and then driving and then there's other wonderful examples of uh, we had a u2 tour once actually the 360 tour and they had rehearsals in torino italy mm, mm. and we had 12 days there right no and if so we're dictated as drivers by when the schedule when the when the tours are yeah so right if, right if you've got four nights on a tina turner tour in in antwerp then you got a chance to have a good look round. If you got one night and then the next show's hundreds of miles away, uh, you'll get much less of a chance to explore. So often, I guess I would come back to a city and think, ah, now I've got the time to explore it. But this, you know, last time I didn't have very much time. But it, it's certainly not the same as <clears throat> properly having the time, you know, staying in a hostel, staying in a hotel and doing a whole city tour. But the, the key for me, actually, was to have a bicycle. Mm. I always had mm. a bicycle in the back of the truck. Mm. Great idea. And so as soon, yeah, so, so as soon as I'd roll into a city, I'd just get in and, and off I go, which was the way, I think. And carbon free as well. You were getting around environmentally friendly. Carbon free. And, at, you know, some, sometimes we'd, we'd turn up somewhere and people wouldn't even really know what the currency was. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, a, an example of that would be overnight Bucharest to Sofia. So you're yeah. going from Romania over to Bulgaria. Yeah, Bulgaria, yeah. Yeah, and we'd, we'd turn up and nobody would know what the currency actually was or if they did, what it was worth. Yeah. But if, if you had a sandwich out of the catering truck and took your thermos flask, you could go off and cycle around and have a little look around and kind of figure stuff out before coming back. Yeah. So I'm sure everyone's dying for me to ask you if there was any um, up close and personal encounters with any of these celebrities that you were roading for. Was there any uh, hot gossip on Tina Turner in Belgium or UT uh, Bono and all the guys uh, as you toured around? Well, we tend to keep different schedules, actually. So the stars are in their dressing rooms mm. while while we're we're sleeping half the time. And they kind of disappear off the stage and then we come and start loading trucks afterwards. So in terms of hanging out with Angus Young from ACDC or James Hatfield from Metallica, that just doesn't actually happen. Mm. I mean, you'll, you'll, you'll see them. You maybe see them in catering and you may get chances to talk to them. But certainly with the smaller bands, there's a, there's a girl here, a, a lady here called Gabrielle. She's, she's quite famous for wearing a, an eye patch. Right. And that's a, a small little tour. It was maybe two trucks worth of stuff instead of 30 trucks yeah. worth of equipment. Yeah. And she would say hi. She would say hi every day, mm. Mm. which is nice. But that, not really. Uh, you couldn't say I'm a, I'm a great friend of Bono's. I don't think I could ever quite claim that. Did you uh, get any memorabilia that you stashed away in your truck that you've got now on your behind your, um, you know, puffing and everything else behind you? Oh, well, I tell, you know, I thought just in case you ask me that, Mark, this is this is the best thing I've ever got. Right. So I'm going to I'm going to show you one thing on camera here. OK, good. This arrived from JFK uh, Airport. I oh. don't know whether you can see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So it's um, all the tour dates of the magnetic tour down there. Wow. And a picture picture of the band. And here they I don't know whether you can see that up close, but they've actually all signed it and it's personalized. Wow, fantastic. Just hold it there. I'll put it on a, uh, a single screen. Now, could they actually still talk after doing all those gigs? Talk, yeah. Did they yeah. have a voice yeah. left? Like, that's a lot of gigs, isn't it? It is. I don't know how they do it, to be honest. No, it, that's what I was saying. I think it's incredible. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you for that. I've got a great shot. Everybody's seen it. So do you want to, oh, auction, course, yeah. that, you want to auction that off today? Is there any uh, price on it that you want to get rid of it? Well, it's only good if your name's Barnaby. <laughs> so I don't know how many people we've got called Barnaby. I, I tell you what, there might be a guy out there called Dave Smith that wants to give you a, a bit of a bid ah. for it. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I've got lots. I mean, I'll just show you a couple of other things here. here do Mark. do, do get, so, yeah. When you go on a, a tour, they give you like a, a little book here. Yeah, okay. 
but uh, Taylor Swift, one. Bon Jovi. You know, you're good at name okay. dropping. You've been on some big gigs. Well, it, yeah, it's not not about that. But the the the, <laughs> the fans always they always want to get their hands on this because these books. This is the itinerary where the band are staying. Oh, so you're always. You're always trying to get, you know, they get fans, they hang around the trucks and say, oh, where's the band staying tonight? I want to go and get an autograph uh, around there. So, th you know, these are valuable <clears throat> too. And it actually reminds me of, of where I've been because you'd never know mm. after a while. You'd think, where did that tour go? I don't know. That was 10 years ago. Could have been Stockholm or it could have been Zurich. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a good reminder of, of where you've actually been on the tour. Was, it, was there a favorite destination? favorite venue that you went to that kind of sticks out in your mind with a particular group or band or individual singer? Uh, I Well, my favorite <clears throat> tour, I think, was probably the Tina Turner tour. And the reason for that is she'd have a tea break in her show. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, could, you could watch it and then you'd know there's a 20 minute intermission. Yeah, yeah. You can go and have a cup of tea backstage. Yeah. That's... Yeah. That's one of my my favorite artists, I would say. Uh, another another favorite was maybe the the Prince tour, because Prince, rest in peace, he, he was an exciting artist. With him, you, you'd never know how long he was going to do. Mm. But for example, or if there's even going to be a show. Right. I mean, he, right. he's just so impulsive. That we had a rehearsal somewhere in. Uh, in the Netherlands, I think it was in Amsterdam, and the, it's just a rehearsal. Yeah. And he says, "I want to, I want to do a show." Right. <laughs> All right. Okay. Right. So internet, radio, the whole lot. Two hours later, this club is full yep. in Amsterdam. Yeah. And he goes on stage at whatever time in the morning, uh, and comes off at three in the morning <laughs> after that. And all the crew are thinking. Hang on, I thought we had a night off in Rotterdam tonight. We're supposed to be over there. Yeah, so right, right. You never, you never quite know what's going to happen uh, on a Prince tour. It so, was exciting. So, does the lifestyle attract those people that are very transient in their life? Is it the kind of people that become roadies and stay roadies? Yeah, I think it. I think it appeals to all sorts. You've got the nomadic people, the the travellers like us, who who just like being on the road. Uh, I would also say it's a great place to hide if you've got a problem. Mm. You know, if you mm. uh, don't like if you don't like the wife, for example, or don't like your husband, it's a, it's probably a great great place to go and hang around and and hide from all your problems that you got at home. And also, there were a lot of musicians, budding musicians, uh, maybe failed guitar techs or failed trombone players, who you know who just <laughs> just like being around great music all the time it dares me to ask the question did you ever get hypothermia when you were traveling as a roadie never had hypothermia it, it god we had some cold weather though that, i bet the mm. yeah the, the generally touring is in the summer mm. so if anything the problem is actually the heat you know down in seville trying to sleep in the day in seville and that's 40 degrees in july there that's, yep. that's getting a bit warm yep. but no we got a few snow snowstorms. Oh, I got my truck stuck once actually on an ACDC tour. Oh. That was that was minus twelve. Right. And it was so stupid. I, listen, I was about forty five minutes from the gig. We were going up to the the Van Halen Stadium in in Oslo. Yeah. And I thought I'll just stop for a cup of coffee. And I I drove up into this service station area, and the the truck got stuck. <laughs> right. so I was thinking, oh, this is so embarrassing. <laughs> my truck. My truck was the rigging truck, and right. so the rigging has to go into the stadium yeah. before anything else. So you can't put, you can't hang lights if you haven't got any rigging. Getting rigging, yeah. Mm. Oh no, so embarrassing! And amazingly, this a friend of mine, he's Namibian, and I thought, well, he won't know what to do. You don't get snow in Namibia, <laughs> and he poured, he poured hot water over the tires, and I thought, no, this is going to make it worse. That's going to turn it into ice. But amazingly, we moved forward, and I was out of there, and kind of kept that, kept that quiet incredible and you got a tip yeah. from somebody from africa on how to uh, defrost your truck unbelievable yeah. <laughs> so how long were you ready for when did you give that away oh goodness i did <clears throat> that i ended up doing it for nearly 17 years right on it on and off yeah you know, I'd, I'd take time off i'd do a bit more in the summer 
And then often, for a lot of years, actually, Mark, I would I would do the the touring in the summer, so just live in the truck mm. essentially, mm. and then take the winters off, go and hang out in Tanzania or something for for three or four months yep. while it's cold. Yep. And then oh, Australia actually one year I went to Australia for right twelve months. Which okay. Was interesting. So and then it, came back and did a bit more. It was a lifestyle where you could do for a certain period of the year and then just disappear to wherever else you wanted to go. Yeah, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. It sounds like ideal, actually. Very much so. Now, something else I wanted to talk to you about today, because it's not every day I have a Guinness World Record holder on my show. And I know that, uh, you know, you did something... Well, I don't want to call it phenomenal until I've heard exactly what you did, but let's uh, let's go through that story. So, so what right. what how did you come about to be a Guinness World Record holder? Well, this is a this is a funny story actually, and I have to say that <clears throat> it's all because of my mum. So big big shout out to the mums here. She she was reading a travel magazine. And yeah. Or, you know all those adventures I've had in Europe with uh, with the rock and roll bands. My mum just calls that messing around in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> so she's reading this travel article and and says, "How many capitals do you think you could travel round by public transport in 24 hours?" Mm. I thought, goodness, uh, seven maybe. Right. And so she says, "Oh, jolly good." The Guinness World Record is six. Off you go. <laughs> yeah. So off I went. And I thought this is a this is a great opportunity, as well as uh, creating a, and beating a Guinness World Record, is to do something good here as well. So I raised funds to combat <clears throat> human trafficking and raised mm. awareness of human trafficking. Because I hadn't realized, Mark, just how big that is. I mean, it's a global phenomenon third biggest criminal activity uh, according to the fbi in the world yeah so it was a good cause and and off i went and i did manage all seven right yes right yeah. now i was gonna i was gonna suggest that this um came about from some you know drunken bet down at the pub but now that your mum did it over probably over a cup of tea and talked to you about this i have i have other thoughts so good on mum for uh, for suggesting this now anybody out there who's trying to break a guinness world record and believe me there'll be somebody listening to the show that wants to do something to break a world record yeah. how do you go about it how do you organize to get this officially ratified uh, it's actually much simpler than you you might think. You literally just go, just Google how to do a Guinness World Record and you get in touch with the Guinness team and they actually send you some pretty stringent regulations on what you can do and what you can't do. And with my record, actually, there was a little bit of back and forth because they said you need a witness for the entire event, but you have to do that entire event alone. <laughs> There you go. Well, that's not going to work. So they were, they were different paragraphs. So we had to kind of talk about that and we got round it by having a stopwatch, et cetera, et cetera. But for, yeah, for anybody wanting to, to do a Guinness World Record, really the thing to do is go and see what the records are already yep. and, and then submit your challenge, what you want to do, and they'll tell you what the rules are in order to do that. I mean, there's some... There's some ridiculous records out there, Mark. I gave a speech about this recently, and, and just two two things <laughs> spring to mind. One was the highest number of candles extinguished by farts is five. I've got a lot of friends I reckon could beat that. And and, and the other one, that, which is just absurd as well, is this guy... Uh, Mr. Eat It All, uh, Monsieur Mongetou in, in France, and he ate an entire Cessna airplane. <laughs> <laughs> so what I would say to anybody out there, if you think you could eat two, <laughs> by all means, go and apply for, for that. But it's, it's much easier to do. And what I would say is, is also think about why you're, why you're doing it. It's, yeah, it's nice to be a Guinness World Record holder and they send you a certificate saying that you're officially amazing. But it's, it's really nice if you can highlight a cause. So, you know, what's, what's your cause? What are you doing it for? And, and then you're going to get more publicity as well anyway. Yeah. I think your mum deserves one because 
Obviously, she was sitting at home reading the Guinness World Record book to come up with an idea for you to get rid of you out of the house or the country or something. And uh, she, she yeah, picked. But... Why did she pick that one specifically? Because it was travel, and she knew that you'd be into it, or what? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, she she just read this and put two and two together. You know how sometimes you read something and you think of somebody else. Yeah, yeah. She read that and thought, oh, that's interesting. The Guinness World Record for public scheduled transport for the most number of cities in 24 hours is six. And immediately she thought, well, Barnaby could probably do that. He, <laughs> I think he could do seven. So it was it was like a, a challenge is out there. And, and you know, if, people like us, we, we love adventure. And I think we love challenges as well. It's why it's why you've run however many marathons, you've like 70 marathons or something, Mark. <laughs> Yeah. Or, or, and it's why if I see if I see a mountain, there are people out there, aren't there, that that think, oh, that's nice. I'll sit in the car and drink a flask of tea. That's just nice scenery. Whereas probably people like you and me, and hopefully lots of the listeners will think, I've got to go up that. Exactly. And yes. There's, there's just something in us, isn't there? There's a, a challenge and an adventure. Yeah. Now I can't let you go on without telling us what cities you actually went to. Where, where did you um, go to break this record? Ah, right. That started in London. So you can, where you start, you can count as one. So mm -hmm. everybody should be able to get one. Right. And then I took the, took the train over to Paris. Mm -hmm. That went kind of all right. Although in hindsight, I was upgraded by the chef de train. And he, he gave me a, a bottle of wine and a three course meal. And I thought, actually, looking back, that was a bit foolish, wasn't it? A bottle yeah. of wine at the beginning of a Guinness World Record. But, yeah. uh, but never mind. Then it nearly went wrong in paris because the the trains were cancelled <clears throat> so the the next one was looking very tight yeah to get to brussels so brussels was number three yeah and the the thing with this whole record is that it doesn't matter whether the first leg goes wrong or the last leg so you're constantly under pressure and this this particular record was public scheduled transport right uh, so what that what that means is if you miss a train you can't get in a taxi and cheat. It's <laughs> it's only trains and buses. So you, you know you you're screwed if you can't get the get that particular one. So London, Paris, Brussels. Yeah. Then I flew to Ljubljana in Slovenia. Yeah, yeah. That was great. I'll, I'll tell you about that if you like. Yeah. And Vienna. <clears throat> mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. five. Bratislava. Yep. And then finished in Budapest, and it was twenty three hours and forty nine minutes. So what that dictated it. that logistical right. schedule? Like, why did you pick those places? Yeah, it's a good question, because a lot of people would say, why didn't you go to Amsterdam? And why didn't you go to all these ones that are that are close? You can you can do that, yeah. but you'll only get five together. <clears> and <throat> then, then, then you're out of luck. Then you've got to go a long way to get somewhere else. So I looked at it and thought, probably the key to this is to have an overnight train. Because then you're still rolling between two cities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I knew Vienna, Bratislava, Budapest, that was going to be probably the, the one. And then I looked really at where from Vienna you could get a train overnight. Yeah. And then I had to put a put a flight in there as well. It was it was it was quite a lot of study actually to do that. And you may already <clears> know <throat> I, I went on a radio station actually, Mark, saying <laughs> if any <laughs> Yeah, if anybody can do eight, I'll eat my hat. Oh, Which is okay. A stupid British, British okay. expression that we, we might say. And guess what? Some guy Some, did eight. Well, not only eight, <laughs> right. he did nine. Oh, he did nine. Okay. Yeah, he did nine. So, he, see, but he didn't stop for a latte and build in a little bit of time right. in each station. He right. was literally getting off one train and maybe three minutes later, another one's going. Where I've always kind of worked on worst case scenario. I'm always thinking, well, this is a this is a Slovenian train. This is a British train. Mm. That's going to be late. Sure, of course it's going to be late. Mm. Mm. So I, I'm not going to. It's not like Swiss train. So I'm going to build in a margin of error. But these guys didn't, and good luck to them. Yeah, I mean, kudos to them. They two guys did it. Two guys together, and they did nine capitals in 24 hours by public transport. How long did you hold your record for? Oh, about a year. Okay. 
I think, yeah. Now, have you already got plans afoot to go and try and get it back or what? I'm sure you're the competitive guy that doesn't like to lose his Guinness World Record uh, status. Well, ha- having gone on record saying, eight, I don't think you can do eight, uh, <laughs> I, I just don't think you can do ten. Mm. I'd have to pick another record, actually. Mark, okay. I'm going to run, I don't know, I'm going to run 70 marathons. You're going to run 70 marathons. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good luck on that one. Now, yeah. I want to throw it out there to the audience right now. I'm going to look look at you all down in that camera and just say that, um, let's see if there's someone out there that can do 10 cities in 24 hours. And if you can, report back to the show because Barnaby wants to know because he said, what are you going to put up, Barnaby, if someone does 10 cities in 24 hours? Have you got... A piece of memorabilia, perhaps, from your roadie day that you could give away on the show. Oh, that's an idea. Yeah, I've got half a dozen ACDC plectrums. Yeah, okay. we could we could give a couple of those away, couldn't we? Okay, so if you're out there, and thank you for that, Barnaby, I'll put you on the spot with that one. But if you're out there, um, go and try and get to 10 cities, capital cities, they have to be, Barnaby, correct? 10 capital cities? Cap- capital cities, yep. Yep. In, uh, in less than 24 hours, and uh, Barnaby's going to give you some Metallica memorabilia that you can probably auction off on eBay for lots and lots of money. So there we go. <laughs> Hang on a minute. They, they shouldn't auction it off. They should have it as a, <laughs> as a reward, yeah. The, I'm sure, I'm one sure. of them, the, the only place you could do it is definitely Europe. Mm. You couldn't do it anywhere else. Mm. That's number one. And actually, I made a bit of a mistake there. My first proposal included Zurich. Oh, okay. Yeah, and of course, Zurich is not the capital of Switzerland. It's not. I completely mm. forgot. It is, in fact, Bern, which most people don't seem to know. So yep. I made a mistake as a travel expert in my first proposal. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Yeah. I wanted to touch for a minute on the more serious side of the human trafficking experience and, and how that was the major cause behind um, your fundraising efforts, which I applaud you for. Some, something else I read that came out of that was a course that was developed for tour guides in terms of creating greater awareness around that. Can you talk to us about that for a second? Oh, absolutely, yeah. The, the whole human trafficking had such an impact on me, just that I was wowed that it didn't. slavery didn't end in 1888. It's still going on in 2020, and something like 25 million people are enslaved today which is just incredible to me. And I felt after learning about this in San Francisco with a a tour director training school that I would put together a course and actually they added to the course and it's now available. It's to just be aware what you can do to prevent it. If you spot it, keep yourself safe with how to report it, uh, the statistics involved. And that's, uh, if I'm allowed to do a quick plug there, Mark, it's, it's eastguideswesttraining.com yep. slash shop. Yeah, if we brilliant. can put that in the, the notes. It's a free course. Uh, yeah. it's, in, it's in our <clears throat> shop, but it's, it's such a, I think it's such an important thing just to be aware that this is going on using the same tourism infrastructure that, that tourists and tour directors and tour operators are using at the same time. Yeah. I love that because, you know, as travelers, we're often always out there and we're not uh, fully aware, mindful or conscious of all the bad things that are going on around us. You know, we could quite easily be sitting next to somebody on a plane or a train or whatever that's involved in these illegal trades. And uh, I'm glad that you have been uh, somebody that's come on my show today to talk about it because it's created a little bit of awareness and we'll make sure that we post everything in the show notes so people can get their hands on that. And whilst we're all not traveling as much as we're used to, it's a good time to maybe catch up on some reading and uh, get all those statistics in hand. Barnaby, we're rushing through our time and it's great talking to you. I wanted to know more, though, before we finish up today about the impact that travel has had on your life as a human being. What, What do you reckon would have happened if you'd stayed back on the Shetland Islands when you were two years old and you got a job as a as a fisherman and you stayed there for your entire life versus the exposure that you've had to all different parts of the world? What what's that given to you in your life today? Well, I suppose you don't know what you don't know. And sometimes I'm actually envious of people who who don't go anywhere and don't want to know anything about the world. They seem very happy in their in their little bubble. But if you actually want to be a bigger person, 
you've got to travel, haven't you? And I suppose I've learned that that people are the same. Not when I say the same, I just mean we all want the same things. I mean, 99 percent people are good people, no matter which country you go to. Mm. And a, a great example of that for me would be going to Iran. Mm-hmm. And if you if, if you say to per if you say Persia to to most people they'll say oh that yeah that sounds all right as soon as you say Iran they go whoa that sounds dangerous you know that they're, they're reading the the headline news but I had just the best time in Iran last year the mm. hospitality and the the people there are so warm and friendly and it's not dangerous no no and the scenery just, as well yeah. the scenery in iran is uh, phenomenal and it's you know as you, as you just said a lot of people don't know much about the country at all and it's not until you've been there that it blows your breath away really it's spectacular yeah i think everybody should be forced to travel mm. Mark, it, it, presume assuming that they fix the the technology and we're not all creating a massive carbon footprint uh, because i think it it promotes tolerance and it promotes respect amongst cultures and and that's really actually that's why i started a company training tour guides uh, to promote that respect and uh, peace and you have fostering respect for other cultures because i see it all the time and it's the fear of the unknown i think isn't it you know yeah, we've yeah. got this, we've got this black <laughs> lives matter thing at the moment well of course of course black lives matter of course all lives matter and it's the people that that message doesn't go to that I'd love to see it go to. Mm, mm. That's, that's how you do that. I don't know. Yeah, that's a wonderful uh, summarization of what travel's meant, meant to you in your life. How is the fact that you can't travel at the moment, how's that impacting you? Somebody that's used to being out there and, uh, you know, have passport, will travel. What's, uh, what's it doing to you psychologically yeah. at the moment? Well, I've got three passports can travel, actually, Mark. <laughs> right. That's, that's not bad, is it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I recently found out I could be a European citizen because my mother was born in Dublin. Right. So we've all now got, got the Irish passports. And I happen to have two British passports anyway, just in case. Right. You never know. Go, go to the US on one and Iran on, on the other. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Very it, smart. It, Very smart. I'll, I'll tell you, when the lockdown first happened... I thought, oh, well, it, I was actually, I was supposed to be in Baku, Azerbaijan. Mm. I've got some friend, friends down there. I was, I was going to be down there. And initially I was frustrated thinking, this, I don't stay at home. This is not what I do. I rent my house out usually on Airbnb. I'm always away somewhere. And this is a problem. So I spent a little bit of time wrestling with that. And now I've made peace with that and think, this is, this is not here forever. We're temporarily restricted. Yep. And actually, as, as I said at the beginning, this is a chance for adventures in your own backyard. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So it's uh, I'm all right with it. Yeah. Good. So um, are there any plans afoot, though, when this does clear up? Where are you off to? What, what adventures are you seeking next? Well, my dream is to go to Antarctica. Mm. Mm. That always has been. Uh, as a Shetlander, you, you have a hankering for the the polar regions, even though it's not in the, the poles. But my one of my best trips ever was to Spitsbergen, uh, the Norwegian, Norwegian archipelago. Yep. Yeah, when spotting polar bears there 13 years ago, something like that. And since I went up there, I've always wanted to go to Antarctica. And the other place I definitely want to go is over to Belgium. Actually, right, because right. Because my business partner lives there. So I want to go and connect with her, but not get quarantined. That's the that's what's stopping us traveling at the moment, I think, is just the uncertainty of whether you're going to get stuck somewhere, right? Well, I can recommend Belgium. 1,700 yep. varieties of beer for you to try if you do get stuck Ooh. in uh, in quarantine or anything. And if you do make right. it to Antarctica, which I'm sure you will, you'll probably have to come past this good country down here and... Uh, expect you to drop in and say hello because we've got a fair few traveling friends down here that we can have a good chat to you about uh, all sorts of things down in antarctica so that'd be great to see you down yeah. this way barnaby oh that would be good my brother actually he's a head chef in melbourne and oh right okay every year every year the whole family says right let's go to australia and every year we think it's a long way <laughs> and, you know, and kind of something gets in the, gets in the, the way you know that's uh, if, if that's a british 
thing, isn't it? I was telling somebody this uh, the other day. Stop me if we're running out of time, Mark. That you've got a UK astronaut and a US astronaut, right? And they get up to the moon and they're televised. So mm. the mm. US guy will be, <clears throat> yeehaw, this is what we've achieved. We're the best nation on earth, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, the British person, I can guarantee, the first thing they'll say is, oh, the trouble we've had getting here. <laughs> It's just the, the, the British constitution. That that sums up the whole irony of British travellers, I'd say, in one sentence, very, very easily. They yeah, they are, yeah. Barnaby, it's been fantastic fun having you on the Global Travel Channel podcast show today. Thank you very much for joining me. I'm going to have to get you back again sometime in the future because there's so many things that I haven't even asked you today that I wanted to go over with you. But we'll get you back sure. and have a chat. Yeah. And uh, thanks for joining us from Hastings and telling us about why everybody should come to Hastings. I'm sure the Tourism Board will love you for that. And also, the place is going to be flooded after we can all travel again. We'll be coming to Hastings. Oh, I'm well, looking forward to having you and everybody. I'm a big fan of the show, Mark. You're doing a great job. I love it. Brilliant. Thanks, and we'll see you again, Barnaby.